so guys, please uh, just want to bring your attention to the next board is going to be so dry. So, so dry. Like uh, we are going to do some code reading uh, probably from now until we finish the class. And I'm pretty sure that is going to be so dry. OK, but uh, I'm asking you for your patience because as soon as we uh, turn this into a uh, numerical example, you will see it's not that bad. It's, it's going to be OK. Now you guys remember that in the last class we talked about beta. And what is beta? Beta is a ratio, a unitless number that is going to show you the portion of the concrete that will stay uncracked. OK, and because it's uncracked, it's going to contribute to the shear or concrete shear capacity. Uh, now, how do we find the beta in the last class? We went very, very quickly, very, very quickly right away. I said, OK, you know what? Read 11.3.6 and uh, A, it says slabs or footing with overall thickness not greater than 350. It means uh, if you go a little bit up, you will read beta as equal to 21 percent and theta is equal to 40, 42 degrees. It's over there, huh? so you can see here. Uh, beta is 0.21, like 21 percent, and theta is 42 degrees. For what? For those cases A, B, C, D, E. And quickly we went here, we took this number and then put it back in our equation and we're able to solve the numerical example of last class. Today I'm going to spend some time, more time, to tell you the story from the beginning. So we have, uh, uh, the code gives us a long a close to tell us how to find uh, the beta and theta. And uh, you have to read it from the beginning, like it's close 11.3.6. And uh, you need to start from 11.3.6.1. 11.3.6.1. It's on top of the page of my current slide. OK, so it says here, it says member subjected to significant axial tension. Now I want to ask you like a question, guys, uh, and this question, by the way, it doesn't have any math behind just your how do you feel now when, when you think that a member that's subjected to tension. Does it help the shear? Or it hurts the shear? If you're designing a member and this member is subjected to shear. Together with the shear, we also have axial force, and the axial force is tension. What do you think? Tension. Does it hurt the shear? It hurts the shear. Can I ask you like a, a simple question? Like, how did you how did you find this answer? Do you have any math or just by the feeling that you know shear? Just shear just is, by common sense. I mean, if you have shear, uh, shear forces, and then you're adding um, another type of force like that well it's i don't they don't they're not they're not counteracting forces so i wouldn't think it would help it so i okay, think it'll so, make it worse okay so let me ask you how about if this tension is a compression if it's a compression compression does it help or hurts your uh, your shear well compression is the same type of idea as shear is it not so it, it would still hurt it or am i thinking about it backwards uh, I think I asked you because I felt that initially I thought that you got it. You got, so your answer is right. When you when you when I ask if the sh if the tension hurts the shear or hurts the shear, it hurts the shear. But it just was like you know when when I went with you deeply, I mean, the reason is the shear is hurt by the tension, not by the compression. I, again, stand your hand against the table. Put your hand against the table your office and then push hard down and try to move horizontally. You see what happens? You get more resistance. How about if you try to pull your hands up and then you try to move your hand uh, on the table? You get no resistance, huh? So tension okay, yeah. hurts. I, I was just thinking about it backwards in my head. Yeah, so tension, tension, it hurts the shear. Compression, it helps the shear because compression, it closes the crack. It, it, it makes concrete under under stress. It means it, it increases the shear capacity of concrete. Tension, it doesn't. 
tension, it reduces the shear capacity of concrete. So anyway, hopefully this makes sense for you. So the code is saying here is, if you are designing a member and this member is subject to significant axial tension, I remember, uh, tension, because axial is axial, it can be tension or compression, but we're specific, it is tension, axial tension. So the value of the theta and beta, you have to read another clause to find uh, the uh, value of the beta and theta. Now, let me ask you, do you think in our course here, do, do we design, uh, we so far what we learned how to design, design slabs and beams. Does slab or beam have axial tension force? Like, like early on, I draw for you the parabola. What is the parabola for assembly supported? That's a bending moment. And then on another chapter, I draw the shear force diagram. What is the axial tension force diagram on the beam? Do we have any axial tension force on a beam? Only the one in the reaction part, no? But the reaction causes shear to your beam, not tension or compression. Mm. So guys, here is the conclusion, if you don't get it. In our course here, we are not designing any member, any member that has axial tension force. Uh, we're designing beams and slabs and columns, so there's no tension force, and that's why we don't have to worry about this clause at all. We will never need to do that. Now, so next is, you look at 11.3.6.2, and what does it say here? It says values for special member types. So if in the code, uh, there are some types of the concrete member. If they meet these conditions in on A or B or C or D or E, then the code tells you to use the beta of 21% and the theta of 42 degrees. Now, same as we did for the concrete slab that we designed last class. Last class, I think the thickness was somewhere in between 350, maybe 200, maybe 150. Where you have a slab less than 350 thickness, then what you do is, is you use alpha, sorry, beta is equal to 21% and theta is 42 degrees. And there are some other things, guys, here, uh, like if you're designing footing, or designing beams with overall thickness not greater than 250. So you say, ma, if you're designing on C here, on C, if you were to design a beam with overall thickness, like the H is not more than 250, it means use 21%. And I can tell you something, guys, those are very, very slim members. Like if you look at, read those, those are very, very slim members. And I'll tell you something, uh, typically, you always make benefit of A, close A, because our beam, like what do you think about the beam? The beam thickness is 250. It means the beam thickness is 10 inches. Will you ever see this beam, 10 inches beam? And remember, the beam is measured from the top of the slab. The beam thickness is measured from the top of the slab. It means a 10 inch, 10 inch beam. I don't think that anybody will see that. And that's why I'll tell you this basically, this clause here is for the slab. And maybe I'll draw a box here. So a box here, this one basically is the one that you're going to use. If you have a slab with overall thickness that is not more than 350, here we go. We use beta is equal to 21% and theta is equal to 40. Theta is equal to 42 degrees. Okay. Now, oh. how about our beam? Like, you know, look at this. So now we have a beam. So what to do? We're, so our beam is not subjected to axial uh, tension force, and our beam doesn't fall into one of those categories on 11.3.6.2, whether A or B or C or D or E. So then what to do? So let me show you. So next is, next is, I don't know why my... Hey, Tahir, uh -huh. um, if you, you're saying that a beam less than 10 inches is very uncommon, is that because they can achieve the same thing for a lot less cost by making it out of wood? Uh, no, 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 that's not, that's not thing. The thing is how, how does, how the beam will make a support for the slab if the beam is, this, is the same thickness of the slab? Correct. Like, like I see that that makes more sense. 
as I said, guys, some of you may think that the beam thickness will start from the underside of the slab, and that's not true. The beam thickness starts from the from the uh, on top of the slab. I said this several times, which means if I have beam thickness of 250, and I said before our slab will be eight inches, will be uh, maybe 11 inches, maybe 12 inches, sometime at maximum, which means the beam is almost the same thickness of the slab. Okay. So guys, look at this, please. I don't know what's happening to my system. It doesn't want to switch to the next page. Oh my God, that's crazy. You see my slide bar? It's like the slide bar, it slides up and down, but the page is still same. You see that? Which means it's slow, just slow responding, so I have to probably be patient. Come on. Try uh, clicking the minimize and maximize. That happens to me sometimes too. What is that, Muhammad? Oh, top right, the beside top the right. X. Beside the closeout, there's the minimize this and part? maximize. Yeah, try doing that. Sometimes it fixes it for me. No, it's not still working. Then I don't know. Close it, close it and reopen it, Tahir. Okay, Mahdi, give me a second here. Okay, see, smart Mahdi. Okay, guys, so what happens here? I mean, here is here is what you always do. Because you, our beam is always not subjected to axial tension force. And our beam is deep enough not to be on one of the items on 11.3, 0.6, And it's always go to here. Always here, uh, the code says you can use the simplified method if, uh, if uh, this is not happening. So if this is not happening, which will lead you to this close here, and then your member is not one of those uh, special member types, then finally, what you will do is, is you will use the simplified, simplified method. OK, and that's what we will typically use for our beam because our beam is more than 250, which means doesn't fall into one of the categories on 11.3, 0.6, And Then finally, we will use 11.3, 0.6.3. And guys, I will give you some time to read. You need to read and then I will explain for you. I know the first time you will read, you will get almost nothing, OK? But when I explain for you, hopefully it will make your life easier. So please, I'll give you two minutes. Just quickly, I'm not asking you to like read the numbers, like uh, memorize the numbers, but try to understand the structure of this clause.
Hey guys, maybe I can start. Maybe I can start. So I, I want your attention, please. So guys, you can the clause says or reads. In lieu of it means instead of more accurate calculations in accordance with uh, 11.3.6.4. So guys, there is a general method that will work no matter what the th thickness of your uh, member, no matter what if there is your member has tension force or it doesn't have tension force. There is a general method on 11.3.6.4, which we will never cover in our class because it's kind of very complicated. OK, so instead of using this uh, more accurate and complicated method on 11.3.6.4. And provided that the, spe the, the specified yield strength of the long bars reinforcement does not exceed 400. Is that happening in our class? Like, are we using what if field are, are we using in our class? Can anybody remember that by now? 400. 400. OK, 400. guys, here we go. So this is happening already. So, OK, so this is this is a check mark. huh? OK, so this is happening already. OK, so this is happening. And then and, and the specified concrete strength does not exceed 60 MBA. Is that happening in our class? No. Does we not only exceed. have 20 to 40. Yeah, but the English said does not exceed. Oh, yeah, OK, then. OK, so it's so this even is happening. So if those conditions are happening, it means we're not really uh, using uh, like a field, the 500 and we're not using concrete 65 MBA. It means we can use the simplified method. So the simplified method has conditions, but the good news is all the conditions are met in our class, which means yes, we're allowed to use our simplified method. So what is a simplified method? Number one, the theta, the theta, which is the angle of the crack, the angle of the crack shall be taken as 35 degrees. So it looks like for all the beams that were designed in our class, if I ask you what's the theta, it is going to be uh, 35 degrees. And the beta, beta is a long story. You will see that a little bit shortly. Huh? So the beta shall be determined as follows. So they give you A and B and C. And the good news is I'm going to kind of cover my C, OK? Because it's not, it's not going to be applicable in this class. OK, so I'll cover this one. I will fill it. And so this is this is what you will see. A, uh, if the section contains at least a minimum transverse reinforcement. As specified by equation 11.1, beta shall be 0.8. And I know some of you will say, what does it mean transverse reinforcement? I can tell you just think about this as one minimum stirrups. OK, so if your beam has minimum stirrups and we will read today, what is the minimum amount of stirrups? Then we can use the beta is equal to 0.18. In, in item number B, what if the beam section contains no stirrup, no transverse reinforcement? And the specified nor nominal aggregate size of the course aggregate is not less than 20. So now the question is how much my beta? So there is a very simple equation to find the beta equal 230 divided by 1000 plus dv. And then why I hide this one? Why I hide this one? Because this one it tells you how to find the beta for any value for any value of uh, of the size of aggregates. OK. And um, uh, did, did we guys say something about aggregate size in our class here? We guys, we said that aggregate sizes. Yes. We said 10 millimeter or 20 millimeter, like let's say uh, 3 eighths inch, and then the next one is 3 quarter inch, and the next one is, I think, uh, 28 mils, and the last one is inch and a half. I said, guys, before that we're, they as, in general, that's from first year. In general, are we supposed to use a big aggregate or small aggregate? You guys remember from first year concrete? Is it better to use bigger aggregate or small aggregate? Bigger. bigger aggregates. Yeah, because it has less less surface area. And if it has less surface area, it means we need less cement and less water, stuff like that. So I don't have to go through the first year course, but in general, we want to use bigger aggregates. OK, so the smaller aggregate, we use it because of the rebar distance huh? and the thickness of the member. I said it in the early in our class. 
we the 10 m uh, 10 millimeter aggregate is used only for a uh, small or thin thin members like topping concrete topping like the your uh, like your uh, basement slab but in general for our beams what do we do we use 20 mils so please it means guys it means this is happening huh? this 20 mil is already happening because it says here course aggregate not less than 20 mil okay so that's happening and the last one let's forget it so make it smaller huh so guys look at this now now it looks like it's easier huh so which means instead of using more accurate method with this clause here we're gonna use this approximate method simplified but two conditions number one my yield my yield for my rebar is not exceeding 400 and my concrete no more than 60 which they are already happening in my class in this case what should i do my theta is always 35 degrees and my beta it depends on case a or case b a any part of the beam that contains a minimum stir up which we will know how much later you use it 0.18 anywhere in your beam where the when where uh, you have no stir up at all zero stir ups it means and the aggregate size is, uh, is not less than uh, not less than 20 then we use this formula to find our beta which is 230 over 1000 plus dv guys i know 100% that this is so dry so so dry i'm asking you be patient and i promise you this will get way easier when we have a numerical exam now let's look at the big picture one more time i want to iterate this one more time so the way we do it is first first thing um, does my be does does my beam have any significant tension force no which means you don't have to look at this close here number two is my beam is 250 mil or less? The thickness? The thickness, yeah. Oh, uh, no, 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 it's higher no, than that. No, which means it doesn't fall into one of those special member types when I can use 21% as, uh, as, as, uh, as a beta, so no. And then what you do is you go next. Now what happens is, uh, is my yield strength and concrete follows those conditions? Yes, it means I can use the simplified method. And for the simplified method, it, the beta is, is either 0.18 or this number. It is based on do I have minimum stir ups or I have no stir ups at all. OK, and please be patient until I put this in a numerical example where you see everything in action. But that's the big picture for now. OK, um, sir. Mm -hmm. I just realized because uh, normally we use a letter B is not, we don't use it uh, more often at all. I think we only use A because uh, we always have stir ups. Because in B it says there um, no transverse reinforcement if the section contains no transverse reinforcement. So that means we actually use only letter A. So our B, I think beta is always, uh, not, not always, but in our case, I guess. Can you please be a little bit patient and I, I will just uh, you can. Can you please say your com this comment one more time after the end of next class? OK, just just be patient and you will see there is a discussion to it because uh, because yes, maybe we can use the beam the my my steer up all over the beam. So it means uh, I will always be on a, but sometimes you will see sometimes steer ups are not required and uh, and simply I can get rid of it. And I can simply go to item item B, okay? And I think you will see that already in in next class, not next class now, okay? Now, guys, one more time, one more time between now and the end of the class. Between now and the end of the class, we will do more code reading, reading on the code, okay? Now, so the code has a a a, a specified amount of steer ups need to happen, okay? The code, same as if you remember when we discussed the beam bending design, bending design or flexure design, uh, the code says no, you cannot add zero. You cannot add zero uh, flexure rebar. Here also we have almost same thing here. So the code has some opinion on what should be the maximum spacing between the steer up and what also what is the minimum amount of steer up that has to be blazed in your in your beam. 
So let's start reading. Huh? So you can see here under 11.3.8, it says here maximum spacing of the transverse reinforcement. And guys, please, every time you see the word transverse reinforcement, please interpret as stirrup because that's the only option we're using in our class this year. OK, so so basically this clause here is telling us what should be the maximum spacing between stirrups. Now we can see here on 11.3.8.1 the spacing bit of the stirrups S blazed perpendicular to the axis of the member shall not exceed 0.7 D sub V or 600. So the maximum spacing between the stirrup, we have to estimate two numbers, which is 70% of DV or 600 millimeter, and that will be the maximum spacing between the stirrups. OK, so that's number one. Number two, on 11.2.8.2, the code also provides here where, where shear reinforcement is required, because sometimes, as Jelly just said, Jelly thought a minute ago that no, all the time, all the time, we will need to add some stirrups. But in the next slide, you will know that it's not all the time. Sometimes we can get rid of those stirrups. But look at, read how the code is written. It says where shear reinforcement is required by 11.2.8.1. Where shear reinforcement is required by 11.2.8.1 or by calculation, then the minimum area of the shear reinforcement shall be uh, such that AV, A sub V, more than or equal 0.06 square root of F prime C multiplied by B sub W multiplied by S multiplied divided by the F sub Y. OK, now uh, probably before we leave this equation here, OK, you guys know what is AV? AV is simply the area of the of the bar multiplied by how many legs? If you guys remember, if I have 10 M and I have two legs, this number is 200. So this number must be more than 0.06. And all of us, we know huh? what is F prime C? We know what is F field? We supposed to know those are the steel and concrete strength. And then what is S? S is the spacing between the stirrup. The only thing that probably some of you will ask me, what is B sub W? Does anybody have this question by now? What is B sub W? The width of the beam, the concrete beam. Guys, B sub W, it's the, it's the width of the web of your beam. The width of the web, OK? So if I draw here a section of the beam, you guys know that beam can be anything, can be I section, can be T section, can be any shape. However, I said early on in my class that uh, the most common one is the rectangular section is easy to build. The other section are, are for pre cast and pre stressed. And look at this, please. If if this is the width of the web, so you can think about it that same as the B, okay? Because the web, this is the web of the beam from here to there, and it's called B sub W. And then and then this one here is the B, the width of my beam that we always use, ah, B. So it looks like B sub W is B for rectangular beam. For other shape, no. But for uh, uh, for uh, for rectangular beam, the B sub W is the simply the width of your beam. Is that clear, guys? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So now, so here is what Jelly was saying. Okay. Well, she's just Jelly. She was uh, th thinking that you know what? Any time, any time I build the beam, no, it has to have some stirrup. But you will see when you read eleven point two point eight point one you will see when exactly we should add some stirrup. Let's read, please. So on 11.2.8.1, it reads as follows. It, it says a minimum area of shear reinforcement, which is stirrup, huh? a minimum area of stirrup shall be provided in the following regions. A minimum area of stirrup shall be provided in the following region. In region of flexure B members where factored shear VF exceeds VC. And guys, uh, please, I said before, anytime you see V sub P, ignore it because it's pre-stressing and we're not using any pre-stressing. 
Does this statement make sense for you? When the DF exceeds the VC? Does it make sense for you? Yeah, it makes sense. 100%. Oh my God, 100%. If concrete cannot do by itself, let's say I have a force to resist is equal to 200. Concrete can do only 100. What else can I do to make my beam safe? I need to add some stirrups. So hopefully this makes sense for you, huh? When VF exceeds VC, I need to come up with VS to cover the shortage, the deficiency. OK, so that's that's uh, it makes sense. So it means I need to provide this stir up wh wherever on the beam where there is a VF uh, exceeds VC. Number B, number B in region of beams with an overall thickness greater than 750. Guys, I know that probably you'll be surprised. So what does it mean? It means even if my VF, even if my concrete can do by itself, even if my concrete can do by itself and no need for stir up. However, the thickness of my beam exceeds 750. It means no, even if my concrete is very strong, I still have to add minimum stir ups. And then number C, this is outside the scope of our class because it's talking about torsion, huh? torsion. So the torsion, we're not going to cover torsion in our class, and that's why I kind of crossed this one out. So we, let's focus for A or B. So one more time, where should I add? Huh? Where should I add or where I must add? I'm going to say it one more time, where I must add the minimum uh, syrup number one, where VF exceeds VC. It makes sense. Because simply if I don't, it means my beam is going to fail. Number two, and it has no business with VF. Number two, whenever my beam overall thickness, which is the H, is greater than 750. I'm asking you guys, what if we have one area of my beam that none of those is happening? Like it is not A or not B. What can I do? Can you respond, Jelly? I have a beam and some, some region of the beam the VC exceeds VF. The VC exceeds VF. And my beam thickness is not more than 750. Can I live without any stir up? Hello? Hello? Are you guys listening to me? Yeah, we're listening. We're just letting Jilly answer. Oh, uh, it, it, it will. Uh, well, according to the statement here, we need. That's why our beta here is always 0 0.018 because according to A and B, we really need to add the the the, the transverse. Uh, we really need to add the matter is 0 0.018 in this case. But if our uh, our uh, B, our I mean, if our beam has less than 750, is that what you ask, sir? My question is, what if 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 one region of my beam, a region of my beam, or even the entire beam, the thickness is less than 750 and mm -hmm. the VC is greater than VF? What can I do? Mm -hmm. Should I still have to add, still have mm -hmm. to add minimum stir up, or that's not required by the code? Let me know. It, I, I think you don't need to. Exactly. You don't need. You don't need. Exactly. So now we get the point, huh? So if if my beam is is 750 or less and VC exceeds VF, it means I don't have to add any stir up. My beam can do it by itself. OK, OK, excellent. So now I already answered your question. Huh? Now let's move on to the last one, which this is. I would say this is the most difficult clause I can explain in the whole course. OK, so it says here factor the shear resistance. Equal to VC, VR is equal to VC plus VS. There is nothing super about it, huh? This one is easy. So my VR, my VR is equal to a concrete portion and then steel portion. So no, no magic, no super science. And we already crossed the V sub B, huh? For pre-stressing. However, V shall this VR shall not exceed shall not exceed this number. And 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 I I I know in, some of you will wonder why this is hard to explain. Okay, guys, why should I mean sh why this is hard to explain? I'll try to give you some kind of background. Do you guys remember row balanced? Does anybody in this class remember row balance and and yes. what it does? 
So yeah. what is yes. row balanced? And why we try to avoid row balanced? Uh, well, um, first of all, row balance without that um, uh, 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 interpolation, if we go to AS over B, BD, so that will identify on what is exactly the the, the, the failure type of our uh, beam. Okay, guys. Thank you, Jelly. So, guys, just a quick reminder. Row balanced is the balanced failure. Anytime we add reinforcement more than row balanced, it means I have so much rebar in my so much rebar in my uh, beam, which will force my concrete to fail first in compression. And concrete is a brittle material. It fails brittlely in compression. And that's why I don't like it. It gives no warning. Can you imagine that we have exactly the same thing in uh, shear? Copy and paste. We are scared from sudden failure of concrete in shear. So let me ask you, if we, if my concrete can take a certain amount, can I keep adding stir up, stir up, stir up, stir up, stir up? Can I keep adding stir ups forever? No. The same no. idea, can I add in the beam so much be like rebar on the bottom? Can I keep pushing rebar in my beam? Or at some point, what happened is, we have so much rebar that forces my concrete to fail first in compression in a brittle way. We have the same thing, but the interpretation of the code or the way the code mentioned it is different. So in in uh, in, in flexure in bending is super easy, very simple. All you have to do is you do this in in uh, in bending. Huh? You say row row balanced. I have Greek letters here, so this will be F C F prime C F prime C divided by eleven hundred. That's super easy to understand. Huh? Row balance is equal to F prime C over eleven hundred. In the shear, it's not like that. In the shear, what they do is they put a maximum value of the R maximum, and it has the same interpretation. It means we're trying here to avoid com uh, not compression, brittle shear failure, because concrete is a brittle material in tension in compression in shear. And that's why we put here an, a maximum value for R, the R maximum, okay? And uh, so all we have to do is we have to estimate this number and simply our VR maximum cannot exceed this number. Otherwise, I have to simply change dimension of the beam or I have to change concrete uh, strength, same as we've done with the uh, with the flexure design. OK, I know this is not easy. This one, we know exactly where it came from and we know why it's F prime C over 1100 is not as clear as for uh, for uh, shear. But I, I can tell you, yes, the, the implementation of this clause is easy, but the understanding is not easy. Why the code has VR maximum? You and I can write it here down here. This is this is to avoid uh, brittle. Shear. Failure. OK, because otherwise if I don't do that, I'm going to keep adding uh, like lots of stir ups and because I have lots of stir up, they do the same thing. When we have lots of stir up, then my beam will flit it, will will fail uh, in a brittle way in shear. OK, I'm going to leave it at this point and probably when we get back to a numerical example, probably I can tell you a more details about the same clause here. OK, guys, for now, do you have any question? I have uh, something to ask you. OK, so you can see on my slide here, uh, there is a numerical example uh, straight after this one. This is an, uh, by numbers. We will do it next class, which is uh, Wednesday is off. So we'll do that on Thursday. OK, but I'm asking you guys to read this lecture before next class. It's going to make your life super easy when I do the numerical example. Otherwise, you will be lost. We, when, we, when I say beta is 0.18 or 0.21 or this or that, Please read it. It's going to take from you like maybe 15 minutes to read the lecture for today, but it's going to make you super uh, powerful next class. Please do that before next class. Uh, any question for now? OK, guys, if you have no question, so uh, I will see you guys on Thursday.
Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you, Tyron. Thank you, Martin.